excellent. Did you finish lunch, Tony? That's the big question. I haven't even started my lunch, so uh, we're all good. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I, I finished mine, so we don't want anybody to be, as the director said, we don't want anybody to be hangry. So, uh, uh, welcome everybody to the October meeting of the Interstate Fisheries Management uh, Program Policy Board. Uh, my name is Pat Kelleher, the chair, uh, current chair of the commission, or outgoing chair of the commission. So. Uh, we're going to work down through this agenda as uh, efficiently as we can. Um, as folks have all noticed, we do have members of the MID who have joined us, and we will uh, open that portion of the meeting up as item number four. Um, before we get to that, uh, i got a little bit of business to go through. First being uh, board consent uh, for approval of the agenda. Is there any, does anybody have any uh, items uh, that they would like added to the agenda on their other business? Seeing no hands, I'm assuming that uh, the agenda is fine as presented, so I will uh, proceed to uh, approval of proceedings from the August 2021 meeting. Does anybody have any additions, deletions, or comments on those proceedings? Seeing no hands, we will consider those approved. Item number three is public comment. Is there uh, any member of the public who would have a comment on something that is not on the agenda? Do you have any names, Tony? I have no names and I see no hands. Excellent. Uh, at this time, we are going to move on to item number four, which is uh, a joint meeting with the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, and it is an update on the draft amendment and framework on the harvest control rules for bluefish, summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass. Um, and before I turn it over to Tony to kick this off, just recognize uh, Mike Luisi. Um, and Mike, do you have any comments before we uh, before we kick this off? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I don't have anything in addition. Um looking forward to the discussion. I just want to welcome the council members who were able to make it here today. Um, hopefully next time we get together, we'll be able to be together uh, in some capacity. So um, thanks though for the opportunity. And I guess I'll turn it back to you for Tony's presentation. Great, thank you, thank you, Mike. And um, just so the members of the policy board and the council are aware, uh, if we do get to a vote situation, Mike and I have discussed this prior to, and we will, proceed for this particular meeting as we have in the past with uh, with like motions, uh, if, if it comes to that. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Tony Kearns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to let everyone know that Savannah, Lewis, and Julia Beatty have been fearlessly leading the PDT and FMAT. And the group has been working um, very diligently on the harvest control rule uh, for the past several months. And we're going to have a little bit of a um, team presentation. So I think, um, Savannah, did you have any additional things you wanted to say? Or are we going to go straight to Dustin? Hey, Tony, thanks for that. Um, yeah, we're going to go straight to Dustin. Um, and it'll be myself, Dustin, and Julia Beatty from the council presenting. Um, and so we're just looking forward to sharing what we've been working on. So I'll turn it over to Dustin to kick us off. Thanks everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as has been alluded to, we'll be covering the harvest control rule draft addendum framework. Next slide. So I'll begin with the review of the draft options. Uh, then I'll be followed up by Julia, who will provide some overview of caveats of the different options. Um, and then also she'll follow up with accountability measures under all of the options. And then Savannah will provide a recap of the scientific and statistical committee's subgroup peer review report on the two models, which are currently being developed to help inform the recreational measure setting process. Uh, Savannah will then close out with PDT FNAT recommendations for next steps. And then after questions on the presentation, the policy board and the council will have time to provide feedback and guidance on the options and next steps. Next slide. So I'll open with goals of the draft addendum framework, um, just to kind of get jogger memory here. Um, but the goals are to establish a process for setting recreational bag 
size and season limits for summer flounder, skunk, and box sea bass and bluefish, such that measures aimed to prevent overfishing are reflective of stock status, appropriately account for uncertainty in the recreational data, take into consideration angler preferences, and provide an appropriate level of stability and predictability in changes from year to year. Next slide, please. So I'll start with the status quo, no action option, option A. Uh, that's within the fishery management plans for summer flounder scuff for black sea bass, as well as with, uh, within the FNP for bluefish. So this process currently in place aims to prevent overages of the recreational annual catch limit or ACL and the acceptable biological catch limit or ABC uh, through the implementation of recreational measures that are reasonably expected to achieve but not exceed the recreational harvest limit. The monitoring committee and the technical committee have considerable flexibility when doing this in how they develop the measures for federal and state waters. Uh, but generally, MRIP data from one or more recent years are used to predict the impacts of bag size and season limits on harvest. And so the TC and MC can also um, focus on other factors uh, that can be considered. For example, uh, the resources availability, uh, changes across the coast, uh, stock status, changes in recruitment, or as the different year classes recruit through the fishery, uh, and data considerations such as the variability in MRIP estimates. Next slide. So now getting into the heart of the options for the harvest control rule, we have option B, uh, which is the percent change option. And this starts with an MRIP to RHL comparison. Management responses are narrowed down depending on if the RHL is within, above, or below the 80% joint distribution confidence interval of the MRIP estimates. Uh, the RHL will ideally be a two-year average, and the confidence interval will consider the two most recent years of harvest because the intent is to have a multi-year measure setting process that's synced up with the two-year stock assessment cycle that we're now on with the management track assessments run by the Science Center. The PDT FMAT analyzed a variety of different approaches to generating a confidence interval and settled on the joint distribution method, which takes into account both the PSE values of each individual estimate for a given year, as well as the variability between the two years of estimates. The PDT FMAT also discussed the possibility that this MRIP versus RHL comparison could be replaced with a statistical model-based estimate of harvest and an associated confidence interval, which would be compared to the RHL. The standard MRIP to RHL comparison assumes that the same measures are likely to achieve the same level of harvest, even if stock dynamics are changing. Using statistical models could take into consideration metrics such as recruitment and biomass trends to potentially produce a more predictive and robust estimate of harvest considering changing stock dynamics. So the next step of this approach is to compare spawning stock biomass to the target and management responses differ depending on if biomass is below the target, between the target and 150% of the target or more than 150% of the target. So essentially the magnitude of the difference between the MRIP estimate and RHL in biomass relative to the biomass target determine the percentage liberalization, reduction, or status quo. Next slide, please. So I know that with a lot of information I just walked through, so for you visual thinkers out there, maybe this will help. So here we have a visualization of what I just talked about. First, we compare the future two-year average RHL to the MRIP estimates confidence interval to determine if we are in a row A, B, or C. Uh, then we look at where biomass is relative to the target, moving over to the next column. And then the rightmost column provides the associated percent change in measures. And I will note here that an analysis was conducted to help determine the appropriate percent change in measures for each row. And this analysis took into consideration historical comparisons of MREP to the RHL within the black sea bass and summer flounder fisheries. Uh, we can get into more details on that if there's follow-up questions. I have a backup slide prepared, but just in the interest of time, I'll move, move on to other considerations. 
So like I said, there are some additional considerations related to this option, which should be resolved before this is finalized for public comment. And the PDT FMAT will continue to discuss these. So the first consideration relates to the boxes outlined in red. Specifically for the lower red boxes, some PDT FMAT members um, had concerns about always allowing status quo when biomass is above 150% of the target and an RHL overage is expected. Uh, and regardless of the magnitude overage, things would still be held status quo. So one suggestion was maybe to change that um, to, to a 10% reduction rather than keeping it at status quo. Uh, but really the PDT FMAT has not yet reached consensus on the best approach for this. Uh, there's considerations about mirroring things up and down and what, what really is the most appropriate considering the RHL comparison as well as stock status. So some PDT FMAT members thought status quo would be appropriate given that biomass is so high above the target. And there was also some con consideration and discussions about the top red box. Specifically, is it appropriate to always maintain status quo when biomass is below the target, but an RHL underage is expected? So these things will need to be resolved. For the boxes outlined in orange, the PDT FMAT discussed whether the change in measures should be capped such that the percentage liberalization or reduction does not exceed the percentage difference between the two-year average RHL and the two-year average MRF estimate. So this would prevent the use of larger changes when otherwise uh, needed, but it also brings this option a lot closer to the no action alternative in terms of how this process is done, moving away from a binned approach and more of a targeted, um, more precise per, uh, percentage change approach. So another thing to note here is that this alternative considers changes from a starting point and the current management measures may not be appropriate uh, for a starting point uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, for example, uh, there's you know, widespread angular dissatisfaction with some of these measures. And there's also, also potential for notable ACL overages for some species under the current allocations. The FMAT PDT is considering ways to define the appropriate starting point for each species under each option by using statistical models and other methods. So additional time is again needed to further develop these ideas and updates will be provided at a future council and policy board meeting. Next slide, please. So before I move on to the next harvest control rule option, uh, I thought it'd be great to highlight this infographic uh, that Savannah created with the PDT FMAT's help. Um, the hope is that someone who views this infographic along with the previous table that I showed on the, the last slide, uh, they will gain a basic understanding of the control rule option. Um, this infographic, along with all the other infographics for the other options, were included in supplementary, supplementary materials, uh, which may be helpful to view if policy and board and council members um, have trouble viewing this uh, with the small font or would like to provide feedback at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So option C is the fishery score approach where multiple metrics are combined into one fishery score value to determine what each bin uh, or what bin each stock falls into and which predetermined set of measures should be specified. High scores are reflective of good stock status uh, with a maximum score of five and then a minimum score of one. Uh, the first metric considers fishing mortality or F relative to the threshold fishing mortality, which is defined as maximum sustainable yield or the relevant proxy for each stock. So the F over FMSY metric was updated um, to three categories where F is at least 5% less uh, at least 5% greater or within 5% of FMSY. And so essentially the lower the ratio of F over FMSY, the higher the score. Then moving on to the second metric, uh, which is spawning stock biomass relative to the spawning stock biomass target. So biomass from the most recent stock assessment would be given a value of one through five, depending on the ratio of biomass to the target. And the higher the biomass is relative to the target, the higher the resulting score. And the third metric considers recruitment, 
The most three most recent three year average estimate of recruitment is compared to the 20th, 40th, 60th, 80th, and 100th percentiles of the distribution of the time series of recruitment used in stock projections. The higher the three year average recruitment value is relative to the historical percentiles, the higher the score for this metric. And then the last metric is fishery performance. Uh, or more specifically, a comparison of the two year average upcoming RHL to the confidence interval of the most recent two years of MRIP harvest. If the RHL is above the confidence interval, it scores a five. If RHL is within the confidence interval, it scores a three. And then uh, following, if the RHL is below the confidence interval, it scores a one. So this metric could potentially be calculated by comparing the average RHL to the confidence interval associated with a statistical model-based estimate of harvest. We'll get into that later. Each metric uh, will have a specific weighting, um, but the Monitoring and Technical Committee will have the opportunity to recommend adjustments to the weightings during the specifications process. Next slide. So once the metric values are calculated and the appropriate weightings are applied, the stock will receive a corresponding fishery score and associated bin that will be reflective of stock status and fishery performance outlook. So each bin will have a predetermined set of measures, as I've said before, and the higher the fishery score, the more liberal the measures, and then in reverse, the lower the fishery score, the more restrictive the measures. Next slide. So here we have an infographic that we recreated to help uh, visualize the steps that are reviewed on the previous slides. I recognize that this may be a very small font uh, for some people, especially if uh, you're looking on a, a cell phone or a small laptop. But this, again, was also made available through supplemental materials. Um, and this graphic just highlights the two-year specification cycle that begins with the new stock assessment results, then calculates fishery score metrics, uses the formula to calculate the fishery score, and then determines the appropriate management bin and measures based on the fishery score. Next slide. Option D is the biological reference point approach. And there are two primary metrics that are, determine which bin the stock should be assigned to. Uh, the first, spawning stock biomass relative to the biomass target, and fishing mortality relative to the fishing mortality threshold are both pulled from the most recent stock assessment. If a stock is entering its second specification cycle in the same bin, then secondary metrics are used to determine if the measures should be liberalized, restricted, remain status quo, or whether um, the default measures should be reevaluated. These secondary metrics uh, are recruitment compared to the time series median, biomass trend, and expected catch or harvest compared to the ACL or RHL, respectively. So, fishery performance relative to the ACL or RHL is only considered when the latest stock assessment indicates that overfishing was occurring in the terminal year of the assessment. So next slide. This again is a, a visual representation of what I just walked through. Um, so in total, there are 13 sets of predefined measures. Um, bins one and two in green have default measures and a more liberal set of measures if biomass trend is increasing. Bins three through six in yellow have a default set of measures and a more restrictive set of measures if either recruitment or biomass are decreasing. And if a stock is entering its second specific specification cycle in bins four through six on the right hand side, uh, which is where F exceeds the threshold, and catch or landings exceed the ACL or RHL, then the default measures within that bin would be reevaluated and reassigned. And lastly, if a stock is overfished, it falls into bin seven there at the bottom with the most restrictive measures assigned until the rebuilding plan is implemented. And the fish pictures on the screen indicate which bin each stock will be placed in based on the current stock status. Next slide. So again, we have another infographic um, that provides visual representation of the biological reference point approach. Uh, this again was included in supplementary materials and the nuances of this option were a little challenging to capture. Uh, so the PDT F9 is open to feedback, 
on how to improve this infographic. And of course, um, we're, you're welcome to provide feedback on all the infographics that we show here today. Next slide. Uh, option E is the biomass-based matrix approach. Uh, this alternative has remained largely unchanged since it was last presented in August. Uh, a stock is assigned a bin based on two factors, spawning stock biomass compared to the target, and second, the most recent trend in biomass. As can be seen on the table, stock status is defined as abundant, healthy, below the target, and overfished and biomass trend would be classified as either increasing, stable, or decreasing. So each bin would have a predetermined set of measures assigned with the most liberal assigned to bin A and the most restrictive assigned to bin F. Again, uh, the fish pictures on the screen help indicate uh, which bin each stock would be placed in based on the most recent stock assessment information coming out of the June 2021 uh, management track assessment. Next slide. Uh, again, we have the infographic for the biomass-based matrix approach. And again, any and all feedback on this graphic is welcome at the end of our at the end of our presentation. Next slide. So the PDT FMAT also created an option comparison table to help summarize the options and differentiate them from each other. The first column lists the option and uh, the name of the option, and columns two through six which list which metrics are used in which of the options. Um, so just to clarify here, expected harvest refers to expected harvest under status quo measures compared to the upcoming year's RHL. And this could also be based on um, past MRF estimates, including consideration of confidence intervals for those estimates, or a model-based estimate of harvest, uh, including considerations related to uncertainty in that estimate. So the methods range uh, from the no action status quo option that only compares expected harvest to the upcoming RHL to the more complex biological reference point option that uses all five metrics. So under column six, we can see that measures are not pre predetermined under the no action option nor the percent change option, but are for the remaining options. And then the seventh column uh, list the expected number of sets of predetermined measures under each option. And lastly, measures are ideally specified for two years under all options, uh, excluding status quo. So now I'll turn it over to Julia, who will cover some additional aspects of these harvest control rural options, along with information on the accountability measures under each option. Thanks, Dustin. Um, so First, we wanted to emphasize some things about stocks under a rebuilding plan. And obviously this is most relevant for bluefish right now, hopefully never relevant for the other species, but we do have everything in the draft um, framework and addendum set up so that it's clear that when the stock is under a rebuilding plan, the rebuilding plan dictates what the measures are, not the harvest control rule. But um, the options in this action, um, so that they will not replace those rebuilding plan measures, but in some instances, the options could include measures that would be implemented as temporary measures until a rebuilding plan can be implemented. Because once the stock is declared over fish, it can take up to two years until the rebuilding plan is implemented. So during that up to two year time period, there's room for, um, for example, the, the most restrictive measures under a harvest control rule option to be implemented. But once the rebuilding plan is in place, then whatever the rebuilding plan says goes. And then once the stock is no longer in the rebuilding plan, then measures can be set based on the harvest control rule. So we thought this would be a reasonable way to um, kind of address what would happen under rebuilding plan and set the stage so that um, you know, when bluefish gets out of a rebuilding plan, the process can be ready to go that these options could be used um, when the rebuilding plan is not in place any longer. Next slide. Um, so the next topic is how will we go about setting measures for each bin? 
So this only applies for the options that use bins. So specifically the fishery score, biological reference point, and the biomass based matrix options. Those all have um, bins with predetermined measures associated with them. So the FMAT and PDT has agreed that the measures for each bin will aim to achieve a range of harvest that is appropriate for stock conditions associated with each bin. Um, and for the most part, the bins already have clearly defined stock status associated with them, for example, based on biomass compared to the target level. But for options that consider multiple other metrics in addition to biomass compared to the target, so for example, the fishery score that Dustin described, that contains consideration of multiple different metrics. But we have worked in some examples into the document and the briefing materials about how we would go about um, specifying the stock status that's associated with each bin and the expected level of harvest associated with that bin, even though deciding which bin you're in is based on multiple factors, the measures with each bin would be based on stock status considerations. So for all of the options, the PBT and FMAT is still discussing the details of how to define the appropriate level of harvest for each bin and how to pick measures to go along with that level of harvest, including considerations for how this relates to the ACL or the RHL. And this can, can, this can include considerations related to confidence intervals and other statistical metrics and models. And it can be assumed that each set of measures will result in a range of expected harvest, which is what we've seen in reality is that if you keep the same set of measures in place um, over time, it will result in varying levels of harvest. So even though we're saying that each set of measures will aim to achieve a, a range of harvest that's appropriate for stock status, that doesn't mean that we're trying to you know, pinpoint an, an MRIP estimate on an RHL, that we can take in these other considerations but again, this, I think these are really important details that the FMAT and PDT will continue to, um, to work through over the next few months. Um, and then also um, measures, all of the measures on, under any of the bins will be informed by a combination of quantitative analysis and stakeholder input. So ideally we will have a statistical model that we could use to help inform our setting of measures. And Savannah will later describe two models that we're hoping to use. We could also use other quantitative methods to help us um, pick the measures that might be appropriate. But we're not going to pick it just based on a model or just based on quantitative analysis. Stakeholder input is still going to be very important here because a model is not going to be able to answer all of our questions for us. Um, a model might be able to tell us something like, if you're aiming to achieve a certain level of harvest, Here's 10 different combinations of measures that you could use to get you there. And then stakeholder input could be a very important way to help us pick which of those 10 to use, or even if we don't have a model or we wanna consider additional things beyond what the model tells us, stakeholder input will be very important for that. And we, we will definitely have um, a role for the advisory panel in this because this action is um, establishing the process that we will use to set the measures but it's not setting the specific measures because those will be implemented and can be modified through the specifications process. And the advisory panel already has a pretty clearly defined role in the specifications process. So that's just one example of how stakeholder input will play into this. Um, and also the measures will be regularly reevaluated to ensure that they remain appropriate. And again, they can be modified through the specifications process. Next slide. Um, next, we just wanted to touch on the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation Magnuson Act requirements. Um, there's some, you know, details relating to these specific requirements. So specifically ACLs, like I said in the previous slide, there's still some details that we're going to work through in terms of how does the ACL play into the measures associated with each bin, for example. But just wanted to kind of say up front that, um, all of the options that the council would consider for implementation through the council's framework have to comply with the Magnuson Act. And um, the council's framework action must be approved and implemented by NOAA Fisheries, and NOAA Fisheries will not approve measures that are inconsistent with the Magnuson Act. And NOAA Fisheries provides guidance throughout the development of um, council actions to help ensure that, you know, we're getting a place where we're putting forward something that is 
consistent with all applicable laws. So the first two bullets on the screen here are the Magnuson Act requirements that um, we think are probably the most directly relevant to this action. So first of all, no matter what management program we come up with, we have to prevent overfishing. Um, we also have to have annual catch limits and measures to ensure accountability. And um, so I'll describe accountability measures in a little bit more detail over the next few slides. So um, you can skip ahead two slides. Yep. Okay, so um, in terms of accountability measures, the only language in the Magnuson Act um, is that we need annual catch limits, including measures to ensure accountability. And the language on the screen here comes from the national standard guidelines, which provide more guidance on how we go about having measures to ensure accountability. So there's two different types of accountability measures or AMs. The first type is reactive AMs, which are measures to prevent ACLs from being exceeded in the first place. Um, those are the proactive AMs, and then the reactive AMs are measures to correct or mitigate for ACL overages if they do occur. And also, AMs should address and minimize both the frequency and magnitude of overages and correct the problems that cause the overage in as short a time as possible. Next slide. Um, in terms of proactive accountability measures, we don't think there are any changes needed to our current proactive AMs because um, under each option, measures will be set based on considerations related to stock status. And like I previously said, measures would be expected to achieve a level of harvest that's appropriate for stock status. And the consideration of considerations that go into that vary by option as listed on the screen here. Um, but just the fact of having measures that attempt to constrain harvest to appropriate levels, that in and of itself is a proactive AM. So the FMET and PDT didn't see a need to build in specific um, options related to proactive accountability measures because we felt that that's already covered under the options as they are. Next slide, please. In terms of reactive accountability measures, so measures that are used if an ACL overage did occur, there are some recommended um, tweaks to the current reactive AMs under each options, and I'll go through them for each of the options. But um, in general, there's two steps to the reactive AMs. And the first step is to determine if a reactive AM was triggered. And then the next step is if it was triggered, then what's the appropriate response? So we're not recommending any changes at this point in time to step one, because especially for summer flyers, cut black sea bass, the FMET and PDT thought, you know, that's an appropriate com uh, comparison where we look at a three-year average ACL compared to a three-year average of recreational dead catch to determine if the ACL was triggered. Um, the FMET and PDT thought it was appropriate. This be a three-year average. You know, this is current regulations. It's been in place for several years. And the three-year average helps to kind of deal with some interannual variability and uncertainty in the emerald data. For bluefish, it is actually a single-year comparison at this point in time. Uh, with the recent bluefish amendment, the fishery will move towards um, separate commercial and recreational ACLs. So it may make more sense to consider using a three-year average comparison for the recreational accountability measure for bluefish in the future. Um, but at this point in time, it is a, a single year comparison. Um, so again, step two is um, what's the appropriate response if this um, this trigger you know, has been met in step one? And so that's what I'm going to walk through in the next slides. But in general, the FMET and PDT tried to keep the um, kind of the response uh, as closely matched to the current AMs as possible with modifications as necessary to fit with the intent of each alternative. So to address things like if we have a binned approach, we need to change some of the language so that it makes sense logically with that. Next slide. So this slide summarizes the current reactive accountability measures for the recreational fisheries. And I'm, I am going to walk through this in detail because it sets the stage for the next few slides. So just bear with me while I walk through this um, big amount of text on the screen here. But um, so first of all, um, this is assuming that an, uh, an AM was triggered and then 
first, there's consideration given to stock status, which is what the one, two, and three is here. So already this has some similarities to some themes that are considered through some of the options in this action. So if you're in category one, that's the worst stock status. The stock is overfished, under a rebuilding plan, or stock status is unknown. And this requires the most strict response to an ACL overage, where the exact overage amount must be paid back as soon as possible. If you're in this middle category, number two, that's when biomass is above the threshold but below the target and the stock is not under a rebuilding plan. Then there's consideration given to if only the recreational ACL was exceeded or if the ABC was also exceeded. If only the ACL was exceeded, then the bag size and season limits should be adjusted, taking into account performance of the measures and conditions that precipitated the overage. So it doesn't specify exactly how they'll be adjusted or you know what new level of harvest they're aiming to achieve. It just says that they have to be adjusted because there was a problem and stock status is not great, so a change needs to be made moving forward. If the ABC was also exceeded, then a more strict response is required, where there is a payback required, but it's not the full overage amount. And the payback is calculated um, based on biomass and the formula shown on the screen here, such that the payback um, is lower when biomass is closer to the target and it's higher when biomass is further below the target. So again, it kind of scales so that the response is more strict at lower biomass. And then if you're in category number three, biomass is above the target, you had an ACL overage, but stock status is good. So there's actually no change required. Um, adjustments to the bag size and season just need to be considered, but it's not requiring um, any change. And again, you should take into account the performance of the measures and the conditions that precipitated the overage. So again, these are the current reactive accountability measures. And then um, on the next slide, I'll summarize just the changes from this that the FMAT and PDT is recommending for each option. So next slide. So the, um, the first option, um, other than no action, is the percent change alternative. And as Dustin described that, this does not have predetermined measures. It just kind of has the bins of, are you making a, I believe it was a 10, 20, or 40% liberalization or reduction or no change based on the considerations outlined in that option. So the only change recommended to these regulations is to say that when a payback is needed, that it can be spread equally across two years to help allow for um, constant measures across two years. But everything else would stay the same as under the current regulations for the reactive AMs. Next slide. Um, and things get a little more complicated. We need a little bit more changes for the fishery score and biomass based matrix options because those are two options that use bins. So to make it so the accountability measures kind of fit more with the intent of the binned approach, we change the language so it's not saying things like payback in a certain number of pounds that it's, it's based more on the existing bins. So if you're in stock status category number one, which is bad, the stock is overfished, under a rebuilding plan, or stock status is unknown, then the most restrictive measures would be implemented. So this would be um, whatever the most restrictive bin is under these options, those are the measures that would be implemented. Except if the stock was already in that bin, if those measures were already implemented and an ACL overage still occurred, um, or if those measures are otherwise expected to continue to result in overages, then they must be further restricted such that they aim to prevent future overages. So this kind of gets at the idea that the most restrictive measures under the bins, um, they're kind of set forward as an intention, but they're not a hard floor. Um, that We will go below them if we need to, if stock status is bad and uh, um, an AM was triggered. So if you're, uh, under the stock of the middle category here, number two, biomass is above the threshold but below the target and the stock is not under a rebuilding plan. Again, you give consideration to if only the ACL was exceeded or if an additional metric was also exceeded. So if only the ACL is exceeded, then um, basically the measures associated with all bins need to be reevaluated. This is trying to keep it um, 
in line with the current regulations where when you're in this category, it says the measures need to be adjusted and it doesn't specify how. So this is the same thing, just saying that the measures for the bin that you were previously at, you know, they caused an overage, so they need to be reevaluated with the intent of preventing future ACL overages. And we also indicated that measures for all other bins also need to be reevaluated because the bins are set relative to each other. So if you change one bin, then the other bins might not logically be related to each other any longer. So you need to consider whether the measures for all bins should be reevaluated. And then if you're under that second bullet point under, num under number two, where an additional metric is also exceeded in addition to the ACL, then you need a more strict response. So instead of having a scaled payback under the current regulations, you would instead drop down a bin compared to where you would otherwise be. And then again, you would need to reevaluate measures for all bins with the intent of preventing future ACL overages. And then if biomass is above the target, you're under number three, then this part of the regulations would basically stay the same. You just need to consider whether you should adjust measures, but you're not required to adjust measures. With the, the tweak that this would apply to all bins, um, because again, like I said before, the bins are relative to each other. So you should consider if all of them need to have changed, but an action is not required. Next slide. So this slide is for the biological reference point option, which is um, the one that had the big matrix and it had like the bins within bins. Um, so to address that, it needed one difference, um, or really one major difference compared to the previous slide um, to reflect the fact that um, in the instance where you're under the second bullet under number two, um, the language couldn't say that you just step down to the next bin because it's um, dependent on where you are to start with. You would either be stepping down to the next bin or stepping down within a bin, depending on your starting point. So the language here would say that you step down to the next most restrictive set of measures, which, like I said, could be down a bin or down within a bin. Um, and then the, under number three, the only tweak in the language there is just to, again, reflect the, the bin structure, but it's the same intent. You're just considering adjustments. So basically everything here is the same as on the previous slide, but just with some tweaks to kind of deal with the bin within a bin approach. Next slide. Um, so this is the, the last slide related to AMs. There's, um, you may have noticed that I glossed over one detail on the previous few slides where under that, that second bullet under number two, it says that if stock status is in that medium category, then you consider if only the ACL was exceeded or if the ABC was also exceeded or if the FMSY or fishing mortality threshold was also exceeded. So under the current regulations, that consideration is for the ABC. And again, there's a, a more strict response um, if the ABC was exceeded in addition to the ACL than if just the ACL was exceeded. And the FMAT and PDT thought it would be appropriate to consider swapping out the ABC with um, FMSY or the fishing mortality threshold for this specific part of the reactive AMs. Um, and the reason that they thought this would be worth considering as an option to choose from is that um, it considers if total removals negatively impacted the stock. And it uses more recent data than the data used to set the ACL and the ABC. So the ACL and the ABC are set based on stock assessment projections. And then when we get to the point where we're evaluating ACL overages, we're looking back in time to say, did we actually exceed that amount um, just based on catch? And by the time we get to that point where we can look back in time on that, we might have an updated, updated stock assessment information that could help us understand you know, if we did exceed the ACL, what was the actual impact on the stock? And sometimes we're in situations where we get to that point and we have a few more years of data than we had when we set the ACL on the ABC. And that could tell us that, you know, maybe the ACL wasn't set quite right because maybe there was um, a, a year class that moved through and that was a lot bigger or smaller than average or um, the, the fishery performed a lot differently than we predicted that it would, or for some other reason, the, the impact on the stock was different than what we thought it might be when we first set the ACL on the ABC. And this would allow us to consider that. 
So maybe you exceeded your ACL, but something changed in the fishery that it didn't actually have a negative impact on the stock. This would allow for a less strict response to occur in that case. Um, and this relies on us having regularly updated F estimates, um, which we think will occur, um, given that we're anticipating that we'll get management track stock assessments for these species every other year moving forward. But if for some reason we're not able to get regularly updated F estimates, then we would just default back to that ABC comparison. And again, in both cases, regardless of which option you use here, that AMs are set up such that there's a more strict response if the ABC or F threshold was exceeded than if just the ACL was exceeded. And that was my last slide, and um, Savannah's going to take it over um, for the, the next few parts of this. All right, thank you, Julia. Um, so now I'm going to walk through some of the specific recommendations coming out of the PDT and FMAT since uh, the last update we provided in August, as well as a brief overview of the SSD report. So in September, a subgroup of the Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee met to review two recreational models in order to identify the potential utility, benefits, uncertainties, and limitations of each model for use by the F Mountain PDT during the harvest control rule development. They also provided any guidance as to whether these models represented an improvement to the current process by which we set recreational measures. Um, and overall, two models uh, were proposed and reviewed. The first model was a recreational fleet dynamics model, or the RFDM. This is a statistical model that estimates harvest and discard from MRIP data while utilizing and incorporating a variety of explanatory variables such as bag, minimum size, season length, and wave. The SSC recommended additional work prior to the use of this model for management, including work on model specification, as well as some further exploration on the correlation between harvest and discards within the model. The second model that the SSC looked at was the Recreational Economics Dynamics Model, or the REDM. This is a bioeconomic model that is currently in development for use with the Summer Flounder MSC. The SSC did find that this model was properly specified, but did provide recommendations to improve the model for use with the harvest control rule. So overall, the SSC concluded that both models should be considered for use to set measures within the harvest control rule methodology and even used in tandem um, after recommended improvements are made. So this quote from the report, which was provided in supplemental materials, I thought summed up um, what they found really well. So both models have value for management upon revision, and if their limitations are accounted for in management decisions, they will have real value when they're used together. This would be a major improvement over the ad hoc approaches that are used now. The models would predict the impact of multiple regulations on harvest and discards and angler welfare. So the PDT and FMAT will continue communicating with the model developers to incorporate recommendations from the SSC and further refine the models for use within the harvest control rule methodology. So moving on to recommendations from the FMAT and PDT. The first recommendation that was provided in the memo and with meeting materials is about revising the proposed timelines. The initial timeline proposed for the harvest control rule intended to have a finished draft addendum for the board to review and approve today for public comment. However, due to additional work needed for the models following the SSD review, as well as specifics with the harvest control rule options themselves as Dustin walks through, the PDT and FMAT recommended against approving the draft addendum for public comment at this time and instead reviewing it in either December 2021 or in January or February 2022. The draft addendum provided to you in the meeting materials represents the work that the PDT and FMAT has done up until this point. And as my colleagues presented earlier, there are still some small but very important details that we feel need additional work and attention. So with that said, um, I have proposed, I have here on the screen a proposed and updated timeline for the board and council. The policy board and council uh, will review and approve a final range of options in the draft addendum for public comment um, later this year, uh, with public hearings on the document to follow soon after in the new year. 
And at the same time, there will be continued development of the models to inform measures through the measure setting process. The PDT and FMAT and the advisory panels will meet to consider public comments and recommendations for final action following completion of public hearings. The Policy Council and Board will then take final action on the draft framework and addendum in spring 2022. Immediately following the development of a NEPA document, federal rulemaking will begin. In addition, uh, in the spring and summer, a socioeconomic survey by the Northeast Fishery Science Center will begin and be completed, and the data can be used to update models and inform measure setting. I'll touch on that in a few slides. Uh, the, modern, the monitoring committee and the advisory panels will again meet to provide input on 2023 measures next fall, and then following that, uh, based on whichever harvest control rule option is selected, uh, measures will be set for 2023. The advisory panel will be an important venue for stakeholder input on the measures to be implemented throughout the harvest control rule for 2023 and beyond. And as Julia said, uh, the models are going to help us determine which measures will be appropriate, but they will not be the only source of information used. So another recommendation from the PDT and FMAT was to not include example measures in the draft addendum. After much discussion and review of previous actions, the PDT and FMAT hopes that a preferred option from the harvest control rule options will be selected based on the merits of the approach rather than the resulting measures. The draft addendum and framework are meant to only put into place the methodology of the harvest control rule and not the measures themselves. The measures themselves will be discussed and selected after um, a selection of a harvest control rule option. And the measures selected can be revised uh, through processes built in through different options. As such, the PDT and FMAT hopes for stakeholder input on which options incorporate metrics they feel are the most appropriate for management in the long term in which, and the mechanism in which those metrics are used rather than the option that may seem to provide short-term beneficial measures. The group does not want to mislead the public in any way and the inclusion of example measures may be misleading and that they may not be the final measures selected. The monitoring committee and the technical committee will also play a part in refining the methodology to select measures during a specifications process. So while the harvest control rule um, option that's selected will stay constant, the way that measures are set may change as more data becomes available and as models progress. Again, the advisory panel and the monitoring committee will be important venues for stakeholder input on measures to be implemented through the harvest control rule. So another recommendation coming out of the PDT and FMAP is regarding the stakeholder workshops. So the initial timeline presented included an opportunity to host fall and winter stakeholder workshops to provide updated angler preference data to better inform the models as well as decisions of the council and board. The only other available angler preference data is from a 2010 survey. However, based on the revised timeline I just presented, the PDT and FMAT felt that it would be more valuable to use the results from the upcoming Northeast Fisheries Science Center Socioeconomic Survey, the North Atlantic Recreational Fishing Survey, instead of the stakeholder workshops. The survey, which I'll cover in the next slide, will reach a wider audience than the workshops that the PDT and FMAT would be able to conduct. Um, the only concern raised by the PDT and FMAT regarding these workshops and moving to the use of this North Atlantic Recreational Fishing Survey is that bluefish is not included in this or on prior surveys. However, once bluefish is no longer under a rebuilding plan, angler preference information could be gathered utilizing stakeholder workshops. So gathering this data at a later time will allow for better angler preference data on the stock after it is allowed some time under the rebuilding plan and hopefully the completion of the ongoing bluefish research track stock assessment. So just a brief overview of what survey we're looking at using. This is the North Atlantic Recreational Fishing Survey. It will be sent out in early 2022 to target saltwater anglers that fish for summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass throughout the North Atlantic. Surveys will be sent to anglers that are randomly drawn from 2021 saltwater recreational fishing licenses through state level license frames. A survey of this design reaches a wider audience and captures differences in fishery utilizations in a way that workshops cannot. Surveys like this are conducted across the United States and the best example of 
the application of such a survey in our area is with the Cod and Haddock model up in New England that incorporates survey data into measure setting. In addition, the random sampler of anglers is designed to reduce biases among the angler preference data as much as possible by preventing um, one single group from influencing the direction of management measures. The purpose of the North Atlantic Recreational Fishing Survey is to provide information necessary to quantitatively estimate angler preferences for summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass. So some of the specific topics that the survey uh, tries to understand includes the value of keeping or releasing additional fish caught once the bag limit has been reached. So what is the value of trying to an additional summer flounder caught or black sea bass? Um, it helps to understand what role minimum size may play in fish value, such as what is the value of an 18 inch black sea bass compared to a 15 inch black sea bass? And what are the angler trade-offs among these species, such as what is the value of keeping a summer flounder compared to keeping a black sea bass or scum? Additionally, the survey will help predict how angler behavior may change under different regulatory scenarios among summer flounders, scup, and black sea bass. This data will be able to feed directly into that REDM model that I described earlier, which currently uses the 2010 survey data. However, the data collected doesn't need to go into a model directly, but can be used to infer things from other models, such as the RFDM model, which was the other model I presented. Overall, the survey will provide a lot of different information surrounding these fisheries, including trade-offs between species, and that's currently not accounted for in our current measure setting process. As a note, work has been underway on the survey since 2019, including um, several focus groups in which feedback was collected to ensure consistent interpretation of survey questions and to make sure that questions were realistic and straightforward in order to evaluate angler trade-offs among species. So I know that we covered a lot of information today, so I want to thank everybody for their patience. Um, but before I get to the question slide, I just want to highlight two main discussion points. We're not looking for any major decisions today, but we are hoping to receive some input on the revised timeline presented, as well as any further guidance that council and board members want to provide on the development of the options presented today before we prepare the document um, for your approval for public comment. So with that, um, the staff are ready to take any questions that members may have, and just thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Dustin, Julia, and Savannah for uh, these presentations. There's a lot of information there. Um, so why don't I open the uh, open up the discussions? Does anybody have any questions for staff? First hand is Tom Foley. There was a lot of great information here, and it was put through pretty fast. They spoke as fast as I usually do, which people have a sense they have a hard time understanding because they go so fast. But I was thinking if we're going to set out a survey like that to 4,000 individuals, is the before the people complete the survey and the questionnaire, is there going to be a page they can go to to see a video and a presentation like we just got here so they have a better understanding of what, what we're asking them? I mean, we hand out surveys to 4,000 people randomly, and we don't know how much they're involved in the process or the questions or really understand. And without doing something like that, it's very hard. I mean, my background is not in fisheries. My degrees are in marketing and advertising. And we always wanted to make sure people understand the message we're putting out. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next hand is Kate. Well, Mr. Chair, may I have a moment to respond to Tom's question just to clarify if that's all right? Sure, go right ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so Tom, just to clarify a bit on that, it's not actually our group that's going to be doing this survey. So the North, um, the survey that I described is actually already being conducted by the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. So it's an ongoing survey that was already planned that it just um, kind of works out really well with our timeline that the survey will be conducted and completed at a great time for us to really utilize it. So it's more of um, the Northeast Fishery Science Center's um, survey, and it's not something that we're going to be sending out. Great, thank, thank you for that. Um, we've got two more hands up. Uh, I've got Kate Wilkie and then Michelle DeBall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I have a question about option B, the percent change approach. Um, and maybe if you could bring up the slide that has the table on it. Sorry, I didn't write down. Oh, number 17. They are nicely numbered. <laughs> oh, no, that's not the right number. But, um, sorry, it's not that slide. Option B. Um, yeah, my question is, so in the in the upper left column, um, there's a comparison of the future RHL versus the EMRIF estimate. And I assume the EMRIF estimate is another work, way of saying catch. Um, and so this method compares the average catch from the previous years plus the confidence interval with the average RHL for the upcoming two years. And I'm just wondering why the offset in the timing. Why doesn't the method compare the catch from the previous two years with the RHL that was specified for those years? Um, yeah, and I might have a follow-up depending on the answer. Thanks. Mr. Chair, this is Dustin. I can I can take this. Yeah, please do, Dustin. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so our current process um, takes into account recent MRIP harvest, uh, actually, uh, when doing the landings, MRIP landings comparison to the RHL, it's, um, we typically use, you know, the landings rather than the catch value. Uh, but just sticking to your, your question specifically, like under the current process, we use recent years of landings, sometimes like a few years, sometimes um, MRIP projections for the current year, and then compare it to the next year's RHL. So this process um, that's outlined in option B is, is very similar, except that it establishes, you know, the two year time frame. So um, let's say this year we're in 2021 um, and we're trying to determine measures for 22 and 23. Um, we would look at 2019 and 2020 landings, uh, find, you know, the average estimate and the confidence interval for that and compare it to the recreational harvest limit for 2022 and 2023, the average of those. Um, and that would help us determine what, you know, the appropriate measures are. If um, the landings value is well, uh, or if the, the RHL is well within the confidence interval of the land landings estimate, then maybe that's indicative that we should keep measures at status quo. That's all well and good, but let's say the RHL uh, for the upcoming two years is much higher, uh, then maybe that's indicating that we can liberalize some. So it's a very similar system that we already have in place, but it just establishes that two-year timeline uh, to fall in line with the um, the assessment cycle that is on a, a two-year cycle currently. Okay, thanks for that clarification. I guess I was just slightly want, worried or wondering, like, if if there's no looking back to see how you did, only looking forward to estimate how you should set measures, then I'm thinking in terms of, like, a feedback loop with the stock assessment, and if you keep exceeding limits, then, then a high amount of rec catch goes into the stock assessment, which thereby increases the estimate of the, the biomass and ultimately increases the upcoming year's ABCs. So, I I don't know, maybe I'm getting it too far into the weeds and, and if it's better to talk offline, we can do that too, um, if you're not following what I'm asking. No, I think I am and it's a good question. Um, we definitely wanted to think through these situations. Um, and I think what you're talking about when it comes to like overages or whether um, we're able to react in time to changing biomass, that really comes into play when we're looking at accountability measures. You know, if there is a payback that's needed, that payback is tacked on to the future year's RHL. So when you are doing the, you know, comparison of recent MRIP harvest to future year's RHL, you're incorporating that payback. So um, like the necessary reduction uh, would kind of be factored in that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that helps. Thanks, Dustin. Okay, let's move right along to the next folks with hands up. I've got um, uh, uh, Michelle DeBall and then Erica Burgess. Michelle? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, huge thanks to the FMAT and PDT for all of the hard work that they've been putting in on this. Um, and I know that, you know, everyone's been really focused on divine, really defining the bins or the steps for each of these approaches so far, you know, and hasn't had time really to consider how measures would be developed. And that's, you know, one of the next steps. And so my question is, um, you know, so Dr. Paul Rago, who is the chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council's SSC, he had developed a little example analysis after we talked about this, I think, um, at the council's June meeting, like evaluating the risk of applying a harvest control rule, sort of when you get to the edges of each of those bins or steps. And I think mainly that, you know, there's a higher risk when you're at a transition point um, between those steps, I think, you know, particularly as the population status decreases. And so, you know, my question is, is this something that, you know, the models that were reviewed can help address um, and if not, I do think that, you know, we need to find a way to do this as, uh, you know, the FMAP PDT, you know, think about how to set those measures. So, you know, I, I think it's important to incorporate or to at least address the, um, this analysis of risk that Dr. Rago put forward. So, you know, again, is, the, is that something that you guys think the models could, um, could address? Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, anybody on the staff want to take that one? I can take that. This is Savannah. Um, so we are still working through um, the measure setting process. And so the paper is something that we will consider moving forward. Um, I will say that there have been some discussions about how when we're trying to s determine what measures would be appropriate and what Kind of our starting point would be in each bin to try to set measures around that we do want to make sure that there is some uncertainty um, associated with that so that we can make sure that whenever we're trying to set measures that we we feel pretty confident that they'll fall within that range um, but that is something that we are going to consider and it's part of the work that we do anticipate doing here in the near future uh that all set michelle um, yes, Mr. Chair, thanks for now. I might I might have some follow up after depending on questions that other board and council members ask. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got two more. We've got Erica Burgess and then Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to staff for putting together a great presentation. I can tell you put a lot of work into this and to see it develop from where you were before to now. Um, was very impressive. I like how it was laid out today and the graphics and figures really helped me understand and compare the different options better. So I'm going to, I can, um, if we could go to option B, I have some questions. I don't mean to get in the weeds too much, but given the next step is public hearings, I want to be prepared to discuss things with the public and I have questions about this particular one. Um, I think you have put together options here that are really responsive to what we've been hearing from the recreational fishery at large, uh, a way to provide a transparent process for setting regulations and understanding where we're going. But one challenge I still have, and I raised this the last time we talked, is what does a percent liberalization for recreational fishing regulations mean? And can staff provide an example, not to say, you know, give a theoretical example for bluefish or scout, but just what does a percent liberalization of regulations mean? Staff, you have a response? Yeah, I was just trying to think about that. You're saying what does the liberalization meet? I'm not sure if I'm hearing you correctly. Do you mind repeating? Percent, percent liberalization. So we set regulations for fishing with bag limits, size limits, seasons, etc. What does a 40% change or 20% change? Go to that table, it might be helpful. You have, you know, if you're in this situation, you have 40% liberalization, 20% liberalization, 10%. What does that look like? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, thanks. That's helpful. So um, under the current process that we have, the technical committee and the monitoring committee, 
meet together and perform analyses, um, looking at basically what harvest has been in recent years. And if something is being considered like a change in bag limit, um, there is analysis that's conducted to look at like the frequency of anglers who catch different amounts of fish. And let's say, you know, if anglers are encountering, you know, 10 fish, but are limited by a four fish bag limit, if you were to increase the bag limit to let's say six fish, then there would be like an X percent increase in um, harvest expected. Um, there's also evaluations that are done for leg frequency distributions if we're looking at minimum size changes. And then there's um, you know seasonal analyses that can be conducted, all of which are really pulled from MRIP data. Um, and so there is inherent in that process, a lot of uncertainty and variability. And so that's factored in as well uh, through the different statistical methods. So it's a, it's a process that's already kind of used by the monitoring committee and the technical committee under the traditional kind of response that's been given. So it's, it's kind of, you know, based on these analyses, we expect that these new measures will result in a, you know, 20% liberalization, 40% liberalization so on. That's that's one way that it could be handled. The other way is, you know, really using um, these statistical models that the SSC reviewed to help inform what a 40% liberalization would look like. Um, and really from there, you would probably set like a, a catch level or a landings level that you're hoping to achieve. And then, you know, what sets of measures uh, are reasonably expected to achieve um, that level of catch or harvest. Um, this all being said, you know, there's been some like retrospective look at how well this has performed, the, the traditional method, and it's 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 maybe not as precise as what we would have hoped. <laughs> in some cases, you may see like a 60% increase in harvest without even changing the measures, or you change the measures and you see no uh, change in harvest. So it's it's a challenging process, but that's basically the crux that what this um, whole management action is trying to address, um, helping us to better uh, target, you know, changing levels of biomass, um, changing catch levels, and, and how do we do that? And I think the statistical models are real uh, improvement in that direction. And the, the SSC kind of said um, some support for that, some language to that effect, given, you know, adjustments to those models and, and further refinement. Great, thanks, Dustin. Um, I'm gonna move right down the list. I've got um, Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. So my question is about uh, about the SSC and the modeling. It's been said the SSC reviewed the models. Was that the full SSC or was that the uh, the peer review subgroup? Yeah, good good catch there, Eric. I used the word uh, SSC there. It was a subgroup of um, the SSC. Yeah, uh, was, was it three people from the SSC, something like that? I believe it was four. Correct me if I'm wrong, other staff. <laughs> uh, three or four, that's fine. So um, later on in the presentation, it was mentioned that the SSC, which uh, I wasn't clear on what that was, they were going to be, be able to review the changes that were made on those models. Um, and then in the presentation about the timeline, the SSC was mentioned again. So my question would be, um, one, is that gonna be the full SSC with the economists and a whole lot of them um, that are gonna review this? Um, and will that be before we send this document out to the public or sometime later on in the timeline? Mr. Chair, this is Savannah. I'll take that one. Uh, thanks for the question, Eric. Um, put the timeline up here. So I apologize for any confusion. Um, so the SSC that reviewed this was a subgroup of the SSC, as Dustin clarified, with three individuals that contributed to the report. Um, so right now, we don't have anything set up for the SSC subgroup to review things again. Um, they've provided their recommendations and have left it up to the PDT and FMAT to ensure that those revisions are made and that we fall in line with the recommendations that they have um, before we present these for management use. 
Okay, so yeah, because you did mention that the SSC was going to going to review these things, but I just I didn't I needed clarification on what that was going to look like. So they're not going to get another look at it, which I, I would be uh, I would be concerned that they're not going to get another look at this before this is ready for prime time. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next on my list is Dewey Helmer. Dewey, you're still, oh, there you go. You're still, uh, there you go. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I appreciate and thank everybody for this in-depth presentation. There's a lot to, a lot to wrap around here. Uh, one thing in particular I noticed throughout the presentations, there was the word if and could. And I was wondering if this gets further developed. Will they be changed to a shall and known to alleviate a lot of the, it's not wiggle room, but a lot of the ambiguity of how is it going to work? Um, and also, I expect the public is going to have a lot of questions about, you know, the ifs and the could. Because in my world of fishing, if and could don't really exist, it's shall and known, and it's um, more of like I would like to see the outcome. I know in the inner workings here of uh, this is getting developed, maybe that's how it kind of works out, but there needs to be a template that that's a heck, uh, uh, to me, a lot clearer. And I saw also would be in favor uh, um, of the full SSC getting this. Uh, before it went out to public consumption, because I I, I don't I I don't know if we if, if the due diligence has been done to the point of development of this for it to go out to the public. And uh, my last question would be, could we use this template to be the same use for the commercial industry as fishing up and down the biomass? Thank you. Staff. Hi, this is Julia. Um, I'll take a first stab at that and maybe um, Savannah or Dustin can jump in if I miss some things. Um, so without, I guess in general with like the if and shall language, when we get down to the point where we're finalizing the language that will be used in you know, the final addendum and the, the final framework and the federal regulations, we are really careful about the language that we use for that. So um, I, I know some of that comes into play with the accountability measures, for example. So there, there are some coulds built in there, or, you know, along the same lines for situations where biomass is above the target, for example. So there's more flexibility there, but it's more strict. There's more ifs and shalls when biomass is not so great. Um, so I, I guess, you know, without knowing what specific examples that you're um, thinking of that, just to say that we, when we, when this is like, Final, final, we will be very careful about what language we use. Um, related to the SSC review, I just wanted to point out that, you know, on the council side of things, we don't normally have the SSC review framework actions. And we did have a subgroup of them review um, two recreational fishing models that could be used under the current process. Um, you know, e even if this, framework and the denim doesn't move forward, we could still use those models. So we kept that review really focused on the models and not on the options that are in this action. Um, but we are planning to have the technical and monitoring committees um, weigh in on these options. Um, and, and they will provide very valuable input based on their, their, um, their technical expertise and also just being really knowledgeable about how the measures process actually works and kind of the realities of um, setting recreational management measures. So I think that'll be a very um, important um, thing is to get the technical and monitoring committee input on that. Um, and I guess the short answer for if this is um, being considered for the commercial fishery, um, I mean, the answer is broadly for like almost everything in here, the answer would be no, that this is focused um, on the recreational fishery due to inherent differences and 
the, the data that we have um, and our ability to, to manage the fishery um, in different ways. Um, and I, I don't know if any other staff want to add in on any of that or if there's a question that I missed, um, I'll be happy to try again. Yeah, one follow-up question, please. Oh, go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, uh, it, it was, could the commercial uh, industry be managed the same way of uh, fishing the stock up and down according to the methodology here? I understand that this is not, this is a recreational uh, a initiative is what it's been called. But I was curious, could that be the same way? Because it, it would probably help us be able to uh, achieve um, um, the same parity uh, appears like maybe. So that was my question. Could that could that be possible? I think I might need more clarity on which specific methodology um, in regards to the accountability measures, the same types of things, um, at least in terms of the current accountability measures, where it's more strict when biomass is, you know, lower than when it's higher, that's already part of the commercial accountability measures when it comes to discards overages, but not when it comes to landings overages. And it gets back to the, the different, you know, data that we have and the confidence that we have in that data. But if you're talking about a, a different methodology besides that, then I might need more clarity on that. Yeah, it sounds like um, this is the chair. I mean, I, it sounds like because it's Dewey's going in the direction of kind of the what ifs on using for the commercial sector, it might be a better conversation to take offline. Um, we've got several more hands coming up. Um, so, but is, is there any more specific part of your question, Dewey, you want to address? That, that'd be fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I've got three more hands up David Stormer, Rick Bellavance, and then back to Kate Wilkie. David? On mute, David. Can you, can you hear me? Got you now. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks so much for the presentation. Really amazing effort uh, all around and a lot of great information. I just um, was wanting to clarify, and I think I got it, but I thought maybe I heard um, a couple of, mistakenly heard a couple of, plans for species that are overfished like like bluefish. So so an overfished species would be subject to the harvest control rule upon implementation of a rebuilding plan just placed in the most restrictive bin. Is that is that correct? Um this is Julia. I'll take that one too. Um uh, kind of um but it really says the 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 most restrictive bin is just what's used until the rebuilding plan is all the way implemented. And then the rebuilding plan decides what's what the measures are. So it's just it's kind of saying that the once the rebuilding plan is implemented, then the harvest control rule is not used. It's just it could be used temporarily until the rebuilding plan is fully developed and all the way implemented. Um, and then once it gets out of the rebuilding plan, then the, the harvest control rule could be used again. But while it's in the rebuilding plan, that there will be nothing like these bend approaches or um, options in here. It's totally up to the rebuilding plan what the measures would be. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, a follow up, if I could. Go ahead. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. So, so, um, but angler input wouldn't be considered until an overfished species is out of a rebuilding plan thus not included in the recreational economic model until it's out of a re rebuilding plan. Is that, is that right? Mr. Chair, I'll take this one. Um, that's a good question, David. And so right now um, we're collecting data on summer water step and Lexi bass through that survey. We'll be using the data that they provide. Um, and we really haven't settled on a final path um, and rebuilding plans do traditionally take into consideration angler input. Um, the one uh, instance here is bluefish in which we don't really have a survey, so we would have to do extra angler workshops. Um, and again, the survey is not the only way. It just lined up well with our timeline. 
So we are looking for angler input um, at all stages right now. And then if we did need to transition into a rebuilding plan for any of these species, additional angler input would be taken at that time. Gotcha. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Rick Belvance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, hats off to, to staff for a really good presentation with a tremendous amount of information and very helpful to me. Um, I did have a question. If I understood it right, I think the PDT FMAT recommendation is to not um, not include any example um, fishery measures in, in the document before it goes out to the public. Did I understand that right? And if, uh, if I could have a follow up. Hi, this is Savannah again. I'll take this one. Um, so, yes, we did determine that we do not want to include, we're recommending against including example measures in the draft addendum because we really want to make sure that it's understood that these are kind of two separate actions. So, the draft addendum and framework really focuses on the methodology and the mechanism of how this works. So, we would like to keep it focused on what metrics are important to stakeholders when we're considering setting measures. And then the flip side of that is going to be recreational measure setting. And so that's where the models, um, the advisory panel input, monitoring committee, technical committee, all of those things come into play more on that side. Um, and that's where we were going to, we, we wanted to do that to retain some flexibility to update our measure setting process as we get more data in and as our models continue to grow and update and as the fishery changes as well. Okay. Um... Thanks. And if I could follow up with one more quick question, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Rick. Okay. Um, thanks. So I guess I feel like there, there might be some stakeholders that would, would probably kind of connect the two together and would benefit from seeing example measures. Um, but I, I can kind of understand the, the team's thinking there. I'm wondering if it'd be possible to maybe, um, include like the current measures we've had the current recreational measures for some of these stocks anyway for quite a while now and if it's possible to maybe insert those particular measures into where that would fit on the different uh the different alternatives if that's something that would be possible to give folks a sense of kind of where we are now and then where the potentials are for us to go either you know as the stocks increase or or need more conservation um, is that something that could be considered for uh for the public to look at. Sorry, I was muted. I apologize. Um, so we've kind of done that and looking at, I put the slide up on the screen here for the biomass based matrix. Um, and so we did look at kind of where stocks are at now, but you know, facing, we don't really have a starting point for these. So it's really hard to tell what measures would be and how we would start and set things, but we can kind of get an idea based on current stock status where things may be. Um, but again, because this is still under development, we don't want to create a situation in which we mislead the public in any way, because um, we don't want to say one thing when we're presenting this draft and then something else come out during the measure setting process. So, you know, if, if there is a strong desire to have something included, we might be able to add it as an appendix, but we just really want to prevent confusion and really focus on getting feedback on what metrics and what methodology the public would like us to use when considering recreational measures for these species. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I've got two hands left up and I'm I just, uh, I'm conscious of the time here. We've, we're running a bit over. so. I've got a bunch of commission business left, so we could try to keep uh, our questions short and answers condensed, and then we'll uh, move along. So I've got um, I've got back to Kate Wilkie, then Michelle Duvall, and then Ellen Bull. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't know if we're still just in a question period or if we've moved into discussion, but um, I guess I can phrase mine as a question. On slide 19, uh, it says that. Um, the PDT and FMAT is still discussing details, including the role of the ACL or the RHL. And so I'm curious, um, what, what does that mean? Um, what does the ongoing discussion entail? And um, I guess, depending on the results of how those conversations come out, 
um, I mean, I follow this process really quickly. And so if ACLs are going to be treated differently or employed differently than they have been in the past, um, it seems like that might be a big departure from, from how we'd normally manage, and in which case, SSC review may be warranted. I know Julia just said that the SSC usually doesn't weigh in on frameworks, but it's kind of a lot in one framework, and depending on on how those conversations turn out, it, it I'm just saying I'm just thinking it may require some SSC review, and then there's a fairness component among sectors depending on the outcomes of those ongoing discussions as well. So if staff had, has any insight and in, or you know more detailed explanation about what what does that mean, um, I'd appreciate it. This is Julia. Um, I'll start off. Um, I short answer is I think that there's not much more to say at this point beyond what we said in the presentation. Is that you know what it says on this slide that we're going to have measures that will aim to achieve a level of, of harvest that is appropriate for stock status. Um, or stock conditions associated with each bin. So the ACL and the RHL are already reflective of stock status, um, you know, based on the best information available at the time when we set them. So they could be set based on the ACL or the RHL. Um, if it's done a different different way, we haven't we haven't worked through this discussion yet as the FMAT and the PDP of like how we will actually go about doing this. Um, so these are really important conversations that we will continue to have, but. Um, as we also noted on a different slide, that we are required to have ACLs under the Magnuson Act. So we're still going to have an ACL. Um, we just haven't worked out the details of how does the ACL and or the RHL relate to the measures, um, specifically under the, the options where there's been. So under the current process, our measures are really closely tied to the RHL that they're intended to um, you, the, we predict that the measures will have a level of harvest and we, we try to match it up so that level of harvest does not exceed the, um, the RHL. And that, so that's really closely tied into the, the current process. But if we move more to this binned approach, those are still conversations that we need to have about how exactly does the RHL or the ACL um, play into that. Okay, thank you, Julia. Great. Next on my list is Ellen Bolin. Oh, I'm Ellen. sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Shannon Madsen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually had a question. I don't know if we're moving into comments section, but um, my question kind of goes back to what David was discussing earlier. In that, um, I was curious, uh, Julia, during your part of the presentation, you were discussing what would happen if we had a stock that was going to be in a rebuilding plan. Essentially, we have two years in order to get that stock into its rebuilding plan. And during that time, it sounds like that stock would be in like a, a really restrictive bin under some of these options. I guess my question sort of related to. Um, while we're kind of in this pre rebuilding plan and knowing that that's what we're going to be shifting over to, is this restrictive bin a bin that could only be reached by being in pre rebuilding, I guess I'm calling it, or is it a bin that could be reached by other means? I'll take this one. Um, so when we were designing a lot of these options with the rebuilding plan, taking into consideration stocks that might be in a rebuilding, we were kind of trying to create um, kind of almost a safety net. It's a catch-all to where we can put the stock until uh, it moves through the rebuilding plan process. Um, and so we didn't want to have the opportunity for a stock to remain in any bin that might lead to um, additional harm to the stock. So we tried to create um, kind of a catch place for stocks to go while that rebuilding plan was being constructed. So uh, as Julia kind of explained, once the stock is in a rebuilding plan, it gets pulled out of this harvest control rule mechanism and is strictly under the rebuilding plan until at a time we think that it's going back um, it, until it's declared rebuilt and it can move back into the harvest control rule. So it's more of just a safety net as a place 
for stocks to go once they've hit that point. Um, I hope that that kind of provides a little more clarity. Yeah, I, I think it does. A quick follow-up, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, and so it sounds like um, then in that case, there is really no other way for a stock to fall into this more restrictive than other than sort of being in this pre-rebuilding zone. So that is um, technically, yes. So if a stock, for example, with the fishery score, if it does end up in that lowest bin based on a couple metrics combined, then I think it would be pretty indicative that the stock is going to need to be in a pre-rebuilding plan. Um, so those bins are worst case scenario um, bins. And so there's kind of two ways it could get there. Either it's overfished and is put into that bin, or um, there's some sort of combination of metrics that it placed it in that bin. And that's kind of another way that this harvest control mechanism could serve to really help provide um, more reactive management that we can see, wow, the stock is not doing great. Maybe we should consider looking into the rebuilding process. Great, thank you. We we kind of merged kind of merged out of questions and kind of a questions and comments section. So um, again, cognizant of time, but um, I do have four hands that are up. Um, I think I owe Michelle Laval an apology. I think I was skipped over Michelle. So I've got Michelle, Dan Farnham, uh, Adam Nowalski, and Mike Penn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and no apologies necessary. So um, I'll I'll just be brief. So I I'll just note that I. Um, I support the the modification to the timeline that the PDT and FMED have put forward. I thought this was an ambitious timeline to begin with. So, um, and this represents a pretty potentially a huge shift in a management approach. So, I think it's important to get it right. I also think um, it's going to be important to include in the draft um, addendum and framework some discussion of the survey to, that the science center is putting together to evaluate you know those trade-offs among angler preferences so that there's some you know understanding and, and aware of that and i think there was some public comment on that and then um i also you know would encourage reaching out to dr rago about that uncertainty analysis that he provided back in june as the fm pdt start to get into how to set management measures because i think that that risk as you transition from one bin to another is going to be really important. Um, and then I think the last thing, Mr. Chair, that I'll just throw out there is that, you know, I, I mentioned this the last time we talked, but um, I, I didn't see any mention in the draft of being able to just apply this to one stock. And I think I expressed some concern about that before. Um, and so I would just encourage everyone to think about that, um, about, you know, just being able to apply a harvest control rule to one stock before moving um, to, to such a wholesale change in management across all four stocks. And I would recommend Black Sea Bass. So thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm done. Thank you, Michelle. We're gonna keep keep moving along on the list. Uh, Dan Farnham's next. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just gonna make a brief comment. You know, we've been, I know we're doing this through an amendment process on the council level. But in the beginning, I think it was kind of debatable whether or not we should do with, you know, go forward with an amendment or a framework. I think we shed some of the items off off the agenda so we could make it frameworkable. But I'm still pretty, uh, I'm, I'm a little uh, um, worried about the time, not the timeline, but just the magnitude of what we're doing here. And I hate the thought that maybe we're, we're rushing it um, I, I, I agree that we should go forward with it. I'm pretty excited about the whole, all the different options here and that something should be done, you know, with rec reform. But I think Eric Reed hit the nail on the head there before. Um, we, we really should reach out and maybe, I know we don't usually have an SOC review uh, for a framework on the council level, but maybe in this instance, we might want to consider, you know, asking for that due to the magnitude of this action. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dan. Those are good comments. Um, I'm going to keep moving down the keep moving down the list. Uh, next is Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. Um, my thanks to the FMAT and PDT for putting this presentation together. Having had the pleasure of working with a lot of them, 
Uh, over the last few months, I think the consolidation of information today was exceptional and what other people found it as well. Uh, two questions at this point. Uh, one is where does this leave us with 2022? Uh, one of the purposes for this action was to try to address some concerns we had. Uh, regarding specifications that we're going to be setting uh, jointly with the species boards and the council uh, in just a couple of months. Uh, so if the goal was to make progress, we'll possibly even implement this. So if we revise this timeline, where does that leave us? Uh, and the second point would, uh, question would be building on uh, Michelle Duval's comments. Uh, this was an action that initiated uh, with a species board. Uh, Dr. Duvall has suggested uh, a limited approach. Uh, we've talked a lot about what we would do with bluefish here, potentially rebuilding species may or may not uh, use elements or one or more of these options, particularly depending on which one we choose. Uh, we know that the species throughout the years, uh, there's different fisheries management plans between bluefish and the other species. Uh, are there benefits? Uh, that there could be tweaks to this. Uh, we recognize that the modeling work that's ongoing for specification setting, bluefish is the farthest behind on both of those models. Uh, I understand there are efficiencies, particularly from the staff perspective, of trying to wrap this up for all four species at once. Uh, but I would ask you today, Mr. Chairman, is this the time to have a discussion uh, about whether it's time to split this action, uh, direct it to one of the species boards, uh, follow Dr. Duvall's comments, it would seem some of Flounder Scuff and Black Sea Bass might be the right place for it, keeping an eye with what's going on with bluefish, using the data, using the analyses. But is today the time to have that conversation? And again, what does this uh, imply for 2022 if we accept the delay as recommended? Um, thanks, Adam, for that and that question. So obviously, uh, the policy board has wrestled with that particular question before. I think what I'd like to do um, so we can continue to get any remaining questions and the last final comments in is it is allow for the additional comments and questions to proceed and then park that question until the very end since it is a uh, really a policy board conversation. Uh, is that all right with you, Adam? I will defer to your uh, best judgment and I appreciate your willingness to consider that question today. Sounds good, Adam. Let's, um, let, let's come back to that, that larger question for the policy board. Um, and I've got on the list now uh, Mike Penny, Ellen Bolin, and I think Shanna Madsen. I think you put your hand back up as well. Mr. Penny. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th uh, thanks to the, the tech team, the PDT, for uh, all the work putting this together. I think, um, you know, a lot of progress has been made over the last several months, um, thinking back to April um, and June, um, and the infographics I thought were excellent um, in terms of uh, explaining the basic principles behind each of the alternatives. Um, so I really appreciate and commend everybody who worked on those. I think that's a, a really good tool um, as we move through this to educate the public about the different policy options that we're that we're considering um, and and I think all of all of the options that are on the table today um, you know with the exception of status quo obviously um, you know could help us have the potential to, to help us move forward in a productive way for for how we can manage the recreational fishery uh, more effectively and, and more responsibly um, However, I do have some concerns with some of the AMs as they were presented here today in, in the sense that, you know, trying to think through the different potential outcomes of the AMs the way they were described today um, may not actually fix the problems that we're trying to address if we are overly, re overly reactive um, in some cases, uh, you know, as I kind of understand the harvest control rules system, it's sort of fundamentally designed to, 
to have a set of measures and apply those measures under the, the appropriate conditions and not be going back and changing the measures, um, you know, frequently. I think there are ways to do, uh, to set up some AMs that are responsive to what we really care about, which is uh, overfishing and any any activity on the recreational side that could contribute to or lead to or result in overfishing would be an issue to address um, quickly. So I would just ask the PDT, and it's not a question for today, so I, I sort of moving into comments, but suggest that the PDT take another look at those AMs, um, think through those a bit more, and, and make sure that um, they're constructed in a way that um, focuses on on overfishing as a as a as the thing that would that would trigger a response, um, and ensure that the AMs aren't structured in a way that uh, puts us right back in the situation we're in now, um, but in a more complicated way. Because you know, obviously, it would be better to be sim to simplify measures, simplify our process, um, but also provide uh, the recreational fishery with with options and, and a process moving forward that's that's uh more predictable um and more responsive to stock status um so thanks mr chairman i'll stop there i appreciate that i think um your uh your raised concerns about the am are, have been noted um and the pdt can address those um the next time they're back together so i appreciate the information um, let's move right along to Alan Bowl and then Shannon Madsen. Alan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and like everyone else, really appreciate and recognize all of the really hard work that staff put in on this. This is a pretty, pretty big issue and a pretty, possibly a pretty big shift for both how the council and ASMFC manage uh, pretty critical stocks for the region. So I know that you wanted to sort of park the question about what's in and what's out, but that's where I raised my hand. Um, and I wanted to echo what Michelle Duval said, which I think it's worth considering how we put this forward for a couple of different reasons. One, the volume of the information we have and will have in the public information document, I'm concerned that what is going to happen with this is going to be similar to the feedback we, ha we have had around the commercial recreational reallocation, which is people see a lot of information, it feels like too big of a change, and they go to status quo. And that's, that's what they fall back on. And so it's hard to get meaningful public input because it's just, it's overwhelming. I mean, we are, we are grappling with what this looks like on the water and what it would mean. And so I wanna really think about how we're going to get meaningful input from, from the public. I think one of the options could be sort of building off of what Dr. Duvall's point was, is, is we have a couple different um, options for uh, vehicles to move this. We have framework and we have um, uh, amendments I'm talking about the council side. I think one of the sweet spots to do this would be we could advance black sea bass under a framework that would move, be a smoother process, would move faster, that stock is healthy, it's doing well. And and then if we wanted to do all of the rest of them, then I think we should move it through an amendment process. I think given the volume of information, the change at the, of how we're gonna management, I think that would would merit uh, more of an amendment-based process. So I think that's how we could we could split it up. But I think we need to give a lot of thought to how we're going to get um, meaningful meaningful public input on this because right now it's it's a lot of information and I think splitting up the species could be could be a way to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Um, yeah, that certainly goes beyond the question that uh, that um, Adam brought up. Um, I think it's the, the delay in timing and, and the additional um, work that it would take moving uh, from one process to another is something I think we're going to have to wrestle with, but um, it's a broader conversation, maybe late in the day to start it, but something we need to may continue offline uh, and then bring it back for one of our next meetings. But let, let's let's continue to chew on that and then circle back. Um, next on the last person on my list is Shannon Madsen, and then I want to go back to the question Adam raised and potentially have it bleed into what Ellen has raised. Shannon? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I just want to start off with some some light comments. I first just want to say that the PDT and uh, FNAT have done an absolutely amazing job on this. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work, um, and I really just want to give them a big shout out for everything that they've done. Um, 
I want to say that I think that uh, table one is incredibly helpful for moving this along as I was reading through all of the uh, different options. The first thing I thought was, oh gosh, I'd just love to have something that compared all of them in a meaningful way. I think this does that. Um, I think making that really understandable to the public um, when this goes out would be really useful. So I'd encourage them to kind of think about how to frame this in a way that's um, public friendly. I think it's I think it's easy for some of us as managers to understand. It might be a lot for the public to chew on, but I do think comparing all of the options is an incredibly useful tool. Um, I'd also like to echo uh, Mr. Penny's comments regarding those infographics. They're absolutely wonderful, and I think they really help to illustrate what each one of these options does. Um, to follow up on those comments, I just wanted to say that I agree with Dr. Duvall's comments and my colleague in Virginia, Alan Bowen's comments um, regarding thinking about uh, the question on whether or not this should go forward with all four of these species or whether we can think about doing this for something such as black sea bass um, to really see how this works um, before we apply this across the board. It is a fundamental change in the way that we do things. And I think that bears a lot of consideration um, and I won't stress that point any longer, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you for those comments, Shannon. Um, we, th th there is definitely a lot to chew on here and I wanna echo everybody's uh, thanks to the staff, but there's a lot of work that has gone into this. Um, and there's obviously, this is, this is meant to be an update um, and there's a lot more work that needs to go into this going forward. Um, I, I'm, before I shift to Adam's question, um, I just want to make sure that staff has what they need um, as far as moving forward with next steps. Thank you, Mr. Oh, go ahead, Anna. I was just going to throw it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, and thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I do think we have what we need. Um, if we just had, um, we just wanted to provide an update and make sure that there were no large red flags that were raised with any of the options as presented. Um, and we will be continue work um, on those options as well as with the accountability measures that have been discussed in a few other options. So we have some good notes. So I think we're in a good spot. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, with, with that, um, I do want to circle back to Adam Nowalski's comment or question in regards to the commission uh, and whether it remains um, the prerogative of the policy board or the, the work of the policy board to continue on with rec reform or whether this should be um, remanded back to a species board. There's a, there's a couple things at play here. Um, I have talked to staff about that. Some real staff concerns have been raised um, if it does become a species board uh, issue. Um, if the bluefish issue is, is parked because we're in a rebuilding mode, we then have the issue of the states to the north and the south that will not be at the table um, uh, as rec reform continues uh, because they are not on the Black Sea Bass Board. So there, there are a few hurdles to that. The determination was made early on that this would be a policy board discussion, but um, I guess what I would ask for from a, from the commission's policy board perspective is there, I, I don't think we can resolve this issue today at this late hour, um, but is there a, a desire by other members of the policy board to uh, revisit this issue? And if there is, if I could have a couple hands. Tom Foley. Yeah, I, I just raised my hand to say we should revisit this issue, and that's why I raised my hand. I thought that's what you were asking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Adam, your, your hand is up. So just briefly, uh, I appreciate you giving the time to this. Uh, I don't see the actions that we're taking here as the complete rec reform package. Rec reform is significantly more than what we have here. We trim things down to this. I almost feel like 
Uh, the process we're at right now should be renamed recreational specification setting because that's really what we're focused on right now. I would heartily endorse the policy board remaining part of the broader aspect of rec reform, including getting updates on what we do for these changes to the rec spec setting process. And certainly as we circle back to the other rec reform issues, uh, I certainly think there's a place for the policy board to be the decision making at those uh, items. Uh, but again, given what we're focused on right now, which is these are options that focus on rec spec setting, uh, I remain confident that we would be most efficient at employing them at a species level in the short term, particularly for species that need it. Great. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, I, I don't have any other hands uh, that are being raised on this particular issue. so. Um, I, unless I am taking this incorrectly, I'm assuming there that there is no burning desire to, to split this right now and have this go back to a species board and remain at the policy board. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is just we'll, we'll make a determination that we will continue on um, as, uh, as we have in the past. Uh, and, and then maybe ask uh, at a future policy board meeting uh, that this issue is revisited. Um, I think it's worth worth some time. The, the size of this dog, I, just to, to reiterate some of Adam's concerns. I mean, the size and scope of what is being discussed here, um, it, it deserves some check-ins from the policy board as we continue on with this. So I think the next policy board meeting. Um, the, uh, the, the new incoming chair may want to uh, readdress this. So, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to make a determination to just move on. So, with that, unless staff has anything they would like to end with, um, I'm going to uh, move on with the agenda. Hearing none, uh, Mike Luisi, do you have one final comment um, from a council standpoint? I just thank the council for the participation in uh, today's discussion. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of good thoughts, a lot of good questions. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing the revised version of, uh, of this um, initiative with, you know, the model development. The one, the one thing I will bring up just to put in everyone's mind, uh, the, the comment made regarding doing this for one species uh, and seeing how it works before we try it out with others. It, there could be some problems with that. And this gets to Adam's point about what to do in 2022. Uh, well, we will be in the same position in 2023 unless we apply this initiative to the three species, excluding bluefish. Uh, we'll find ourselves in a position where we would have to use more of the status quo approach um, for, for summer flounder and scup. And, just something to think about uh, as we move forward. We, you know, status quo, I don't think is anything we want to use right now. And so um, I'll just put that on everyone's radar for, for follow up discussion at another time. But thanks, everybody. And um, Pat, I'll turn it back to you to continue with uh, Commission's work. So the council's off the hook. And uh, it's all you, Pat. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this concludes uh, the uh, joint meeting of the. Uh, uh, policy board and the mid Atlantic council and we're moving along to now to item number five on the um, uh, policy board agenda that with that said though i am going to uh, ask everybody's indulgence for a three minute uh recess um, let everybody grab a glass of water whatever they need to do and we'll return back to the table in three minutes and so staff could put a clock up that'd be great Yeah, welcome back everybody to the ISFMP uh, policy board meeting. Um, Tony, are you back? Bob, you back? I am here, Pat. All right. We're going to jump right back into the business of the policy board. Um, moving down the item to uh, uh, agenda list, item number five, which is the executive committee report. Uh, yesterday morning, the executive committee met for a few hours to talk about several topics. I'm going to give an overview of all of those topics 
And then at the end of my um, uh, update, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to entertain them. Um, the first item on the uh, list was a review and uh, in consideration the approval of the FY 2021 audit. Um, Spud Woodward is the uh, chair of the uh, AOC committee for the commission. Um, uh, we, the AOC, had reviewed in detail with Laura Leach and uh, Bob Beal the audit. Uh, no issues were identified, and the commission continues with its strong fiduciary responsibilities. Um, uh, so that's, uh, and the AOC did, excuse me, the uh, executive committee did uh, accept the findings of the audit and approve the audit. Um, the AOC is also continuing to look at our investments. Uh, this is an issue that came up uh, a few meetings ago. Uh, we had a presentation by Laura Leach. Uh, and um, as I say, the AOC is going to continue to look at the investments in our investment policies. They do have more work to do on this, uh, and it's an area they'll be uh, continuing to look at and reporting back to the executive committee and ultimately back to the policy board. Uh, the other issues, the other issue that was discussed was the uh, draft policy uh, on responding to FOIA requests. Um, uh, Bob Beal um, brought this to leadership's attention a few months ago. Uh, we do get more and more requests for information. Uh, we occasionally get them structured as a FOIA request, but uh, because we are neither a state agency or a federal agency, we don't have any laws governing that, uh, that particular type of request. So um, Bob put together a draft document that would lay out a process or, or a guidance, as a, really a guidance document uh, for the executive committee to consider. Um, there were a lot of comments, uh, especially from state directors, as it pertains to specific laws within their states to help uh, bring some language forward that would strengthen out, strengthen that document. And then the, the question became at the end of that uh, is, are we really looking at a guidance document or should this be a policy? And I think the majority of the executive committee were leaning in the direction of uh, developing a final policy. Um, so um, Bob at that time said that he had enough to do a rewrite of the policy. It will be brought to forward to the next executive committee meeting. Uh, and once it is finalized, it will be brought back to a policy board uh, for a policy board vote uh, in uh, or at the winter meeting. Um, next item on the agenda was the discussion of involvement in wind energy. Um, Joe Semino brought this forward. Um, as you all know, uh, we have had some presentations on wind development in the past. Um, the Habitat Committee has looked into this in the past as well, uh, but it's certainly an area of growing concern for many fisheries agencies. Uh, you know, beat along the Mid-Atlantic, uh, or now up into the Gulf of Maine, we're all engaged at various levels. And uh, again, while the Commission's held some meetings on offshore wind, uh, we were asked to, once again to look at whether we should become more engaged. And the comments that we received at the executive committee certainly um, bear out the fact that we do need to have um, more of a presence in the wind conversation. The issue of even hiring uh, um, a new member of staff that would be focused solely on wind to help with coordination and data uh, was brought up. Um, uh, nothing was decided, and there was going to be further discussion on this issue with the executive committee, but it's uh, obviously likely to come back before the policy board for additional input. Uh, the next item on the agenda was the uh, discussion of the seafood processors pandemic response safety block grant program through the USDA. Uh, the USDA announced the block grants for uh, both uh, agricultural and seafood processing. Coastal states will receive money ranging in the many millions, which uh, Alaska, I think, is in the high 20 or low 30 millions, uh, to just a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, there are many states who did not have direct contacts with USDA, and it was felt that we needed to have a better approach to help with the coordination. But this time, it was determined that uh, Bob Beal would reach out to the USDA to see if they'd be willing to give a presentation to states that would like to participate in an overview of the program uh, to help get additional guidance on the how to distribute the funds. 
uh, currently eight states um, have raised their hand who would like to participate. I'm sure it'll be more in the end, but Bob will pull that together. He's going to have to pull that together very quickly uh, due to the deadlines that are coming up. So um, states will be hearing more about that in the very near future. Um, there was also a discussion on the appeals process. Um, uh, Bob brought forward um, a document on, on the appeals process and we had some additional input from, from Delaware. Uh, the discussion of the appeals process, as you all know, has been ongoing ever since the Black Sea Bass appeal by the state of New York. Uh, the executive committee did review the policies around the appeals process and has asked staff to give some thoughts to possible areas where changes or clarity could be made. Uh, we had very good discussion, but there were no final decisions. And Bob is going to take the input that he received at the meeting and will revise the draft for additional considerations uh, at a future executive committee meeting. Those changes, again, will come back to the policy board for any adoption uh, if, uh, if if those uh, need to be made, the changes need to be made. Um, and then uh, what what was we thought was going to be the last agenda item was uh, uh, Laura Leach bringing up the future annual meeting updates. Uh, she updated the executive committee on the annual meetings that are now scheduled. Um, we are gonna remain in New Jersey uh, for 2022, Beaufort, North Carolina in 2023, Maryland in 24, and Delaware in 25. Um, after a brief conversations around those annual meeting dates, the question uh, was asked about this January's meeting. Uh, and Laura said that we had to make a decision this week uh, regarding the contract because it had to be submitted to the Weston and Alexandria. After taking several comments from the executive committee, it was determined that we will, in fact, plan on meeting face-to-face -face for our winter meeting at the end of January. It was determined that the winter meeting will be a hybrid where the commission members and staff will meet together. However, the public portions will be done virtually to help minimize any potential risk with COVID. The executive committee is going to continue to discuss in a, uh, the approach for the face-to-face -face meeting as it pertains to vaccinations and masking. And that that concludes my update. But I would um, uh, ask the policy board if they do have, uh, besides the issue of the January meeting, if there are any thoughts or any questions on any other items that I've addressed. So with that, I will open the floor for questions and comments. I'm seeing no hands. Um, seeing no hands and no questions, then we are going to move right along with the agenda uh, to um, uh, item number six, which is review the Management Science Committee tasks to address the conservation equivalency concerns. And Tony Kearns. Mr. Chair, if I could ask a favor, uh, Mike Pitney has a timing conflict and wanted to see if he could do his agenda item before the CE tasks. Um, he won't take long, he said. Uh, I certainly have no objections, and if there's no objections from the members of the policy board, um, we'll move right along. And seeing no hands, uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yeah, thanks to, for accommodating um, my schedule. I've got a number of issues. I've got to wrap up by 4 o'clock today, so <clears throat> I'm going to get back to that. Um, I, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with the policy board today um, about an issue. This is really just intended to give everyone um, a heads up uh, about an outreach uh, process that we're going to be starting later this year. Um, for those of you who participate or sit on either the Mid-Atlantic or New England Fishery Management Councils, uh, you've heard me already uh, mention this. Uh, and both councils will be getting a full presentation, um, an explanation of the background and the process uh, for this issue. And uh, we'd be happy to give a similar presentation, um, more complete presentation to the commission uh, at the February meeting. Um, but I wanted to make everyone aware that uh, we are over the next few months going to be uh, conducting outreach on potential measures to reduce the incidental capture of sea turtles in the various east coast trawl fisheries um, we're uh, starting a, a public process to to seek information from the fishing industry uh, researchers and others uh, about ways that under the authority of the endangered species act 
um, we could take actions to aid in the protection and recovery of listed sea turtle populations uh, by reducing the incidental bycatch and mortality of sea turtles uh, in our Northeast and Mid-Atlantic uh, U.S. trawl fisheries. Um, we do see that bycatch is one of the highest threats, if not the highest threats to sea turtles in our waters. Uh, and in the greater Atlantic region, the, the highest level of sea turtle trawl bycatch occurs in the Atlantic croaker, long fin squid, and summer flounder fisheries. Uh, so therefore, we are focusing our efforts um, on looking at those fisheries. We have been, as many of you may know, um, evaluating, uh, researching, and addressing bycatch of sea turtles in trawl here since uh, at least the late 80s. So this isn't new. Um, we have developed various bycatch estimates, implemented regulations in certain fisheries, such as trawl, uh, turtle excluder devices and shrimp and summer flounder trawls. Uh, and we've hosted workshops, uh, not for a little while, but back in 2007 and 2010, uh, with the fishing industry and other interested parties, um, which have led to um, many suggestions for potential future gear measures to mitigate um, that bycatch. Uh, and then based on a lot of the ideas of those workshops, we've conducted uh, gear research toward bycatch uh, and mortality reduction. Um, the gear research has been going on for you know over 20 years in these fisheries. And one of the things that we're going to be doing in, as part of these presentations and, and the outreach is really just uh, reporting on the progress uh, made uh, and the various different types of gear uh, modifications and, and gear work that's been done to inform the public, inform the industry and the councils and the commission. But then we're also gonna be looking for some suggestions on next steps in terms of uh, modifications or changes that we might make uh, in these fisheries based on this research, based on this, the, the experiences we've had uh, that could further mitigate and reduce the bycatch of sea turtles in these fisheries. So as I said, we'll be providing a full briefing uh, by uh, actual experts in this issue rather than just me uh, at the December council meetings. Um, and then uh, we'll certainly be happy to give a full presentation uh, at the next commission meeting as well. Uh, and then we'll be soliciting comments uh, from the public uh, over a period of several months, starting in December, probably through uh, the April timeframe. So that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for uh, the time. I guess if there's any initial questions, um, I can try to take those, but I uh, really just wanted to give people a heads up to look for at the next meeting, um, you know, a more in-depth presentation of these issues. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, I do <clears throat> really appreciate the heads up when we get these on the early side, gives us gives us a chance to start thinking about this. Um, any preliminary questions for, uh, for Mike then? Seeing no hands, Mike, you're off the hook. Thank you very much. Appreciate the update. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to Tony for the schedule change. Thank you. Great. That brings us uh, back on track with the agenda for item number six. Uh, so, Tony, uh, you're up now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Maya, you can go to the next slide. In your briefing materials, you received a memo um, that was addressing some conservation equivalency issues. Uh, several boards and the executive committee have raised um, concerns regarding the commission's use of conservation equivalency in different FMPs. And so the executive committee put together a work group of individuals from the the committee to put together a list of tasks tasks to have the management and science committee look at to address some of the concerns that have been raised by the executive committee and various species boards regarding conservation equivalency. Um, and you know, we all, as you all know, conservation equivalency is something that is defined within the ISFMP charter. It is actions that are taken by states that are different from those of the FMP, but achieve the same level of conservation. Um, and the application of conservation equivalency is described in the Commission's conservation equivalency policy and technical guidance document. Next slide, please, Maya. This um, document has some general um, policy guidance and you know, there are both recommendations and requirements uh, on CE. There are some specific recommendations 
focused on the types of information that has to be included in proposals from states. Uh, these include our rationale, data needs, how the FMP goals are met, um, plans for the state to monitor and evaluate the program. And there's also some specific guidelines for proposal submission and review process. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the, the CE guidance document also has guidance on what happens after there's a proposal that states should describe and evaluate the CE programs through the compliance reports. The plan review team evaluates all, e, all CE programs during their FMP reviews. Um, a program can be suspended if a state is not completing monitoring to evaluate the programs. And the PRT provides annual reports to the board. Um, so based on the executive committee's um, guidance, we're going to review the, the guidance document and bring forward proposed changes to the guidance document itself. Um, and as part of that, we've asked, next slide please, Maya, the Management and Science Committee to look at a couple of issues. And I want just the, the policy board to see these tasks that are being described hear from you all to see if there's any additional tasks that you would want the Management and Science Committee to, to look at today. Uh, so first is to develop a better way to characterize and address uncertainty of CE proposals. So for example, could we develop a buffer to account for our uncertainty? Um, and when thinking about a buffer, should stock status be accounted for when establishing buffers? You could have tiers, steps, maybe a control rule. Uh, we don't want a buffer that is overly burdensome on the fringe states. Uh, the buffer could maybe apply differently to those states. Uh, we've asked them to develop a retrospective analysis to see how well conservation equivalency performed um, and included in that retrospective analysis to look at the coastwide measure for comparison. Um, maybe this could help inform the buffer. Uh, and we would also want to consider harvest versus total removals if that's consistent with the fishery management plan. Um, for species and measures that are harder to evaluate, equivalency should CE be allowed at all. Um, some measures are non-quantifiable. Should those types of proposals be able to go through? Should there be bounds on CE programs or any um, is anything allowed unless specifically excluded by the FMP or the management board? Next slide. Um, we've asked the Management and Science Committee to reevaluate data standards. Um, so are there minimum data standards that a CE proposal should have? Is there a require, required, required level of review of the data sets used if they're not within the bounds of the minimum data standards? Should things that cannot be quantified be permitted under CE on, um, for, under the data standards? Uh, should there be a time limit on conservation equivalency programs? Should we set a specific number of years? Should it be following an assessment cycle? Um, maybe there's other ways that the MSC comes up with. Should stock status impact the ability to use conservation equivalency? If so, how? Um, you know, if a stock is declared overfish and overfishing is occurring, then should CEE be reevaluated um, for that FMP? Uh, so these are the tasks that we have um, given the MSC to start to consider, but I want to see if there's any additional tasks that the policy board want to bring forward to the Management Science Committee. Great. Thank you, Tony. Um, I've got a quick hand from Shannon Matson. Shannon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Tony. I think this is a really comprehensive list. Um, I got to take a sneak peek at it uh, for our MSC member, and, and I thought it's a really good step in the right direction. Um, there's one thing that I was thinking of, and it might be that I had looked at an old uh, guidance document, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, when I was going through the guidance document, I noted that while there was some timelines for submitting a proposal, there wasn't timelines set on how long a TC or PDT would have to actually review this proposal. Um, and I'm kind of thinking back to 
you know, some of my days on TC, sometimes we'd be given a proposal and, um, you know, two days to read it before a meeting or a day to read it before a meeting or things like that. Um, and so I kind of wanted to see if there was a way to have a uh, management science committee sit and think about timelines for how long uh, folks on the TC and PDT should have to actually have that proposal in hand have the appropriate amount of time to uh, review it, because I think it's really important that we, you know, depend on our TCs to provide that sort of scientific insight on the analysis that are associated with these conservation of equivalency proposals. I've got that, Shannon. It's not currently in the document, you know, right now we pretty much always pass along proposals as soon as we get them from a state. So we're just bound by when the state gives it to us to pass them along to the committee for the most part. So we'll put that in the list. Great, thanks. Um, Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what I didn't see on, on Tony's list um, was how to handle or how to review pre-existing conservation equivalency measures. Uh, this topic came up yesterday with regard to striped bass. Some of the conservation equivalency measures have been in effect since, well, let's say the early 1990s. Um, is there a sunset rule for these measures or, or when should they be reevaluated? Is it with every uh, benchmark stock assessment, that kind of thing? Thank you. Thanks, Roy. So for measures that don't have, like if we if we do end up putting in guidelines for how long a plan should be in place, for measures that are already there that are not being evaluated or ha don't have a sunset clause, should they get one or be how to approach those? Yep, that's the idea. Thanks for that, Roy. Any other hands on, on the issues of conservation equivalency in the task list? I'm seeing no hands. Uh, so, Tony, you've got a couple more to add. Um, that issue of prior uh, CEs was something I was actually going to raise, so Roy stole my thunder on that. So, um, unless anybody has got uh, a last comment, I'm going to move right along to the next item. Tony, we're going to move along to East Coast climate change scenarios, so you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll let Maya pull up that presentation. Um, so this is just a quick update on the East Coast climate change scenario planning initiative. And as a reminder, this is the initiative that we are conducting with um, all three East Coast um, Councils, NOAA Fisheries, GARFO, and the Southeast Regional Office, and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, and so just as a reminder, scenario planning can be used to explore and address a lot of different situations, particularly those challenges where the future is highly uncertain. The exploration that we are focusing on has two main objectives. One is about exploring and learning. We want to investigate how fishery governance and management issues will be affected by climate driven change. We expect that climate will affect stock availability and distributions. One of the project objectives is to explore what might change in terms of availability. And so what this means for how we conduct fishery management and governance in the future. Our second objective is to take our learning and create an approach and a set of reusable tools so that we can improve our fishery management strategies in situations of uncertainty. Um, so we have conducted or uh, done the first two steps in our multi-year initiative, um, both the orientation and the scoping step. And Maya, if you go to the next slide, um, we held three webinars this summer. We had over 250 participants where we introduced the topic of scenario planning, the initiative itself, and we also provided participants the chance to review the project objectives and provide their own personal 
perspectives on climate change. And following those webinars, we conducted an online questionnaire to gather input on the initiative and the forces of change that can be affecting fisheries over the next 20 years. We received 383 responses to the survey. Um, it has a, we have a lot of information to dig through and we'll be doing that over the course of the fall. Um, Maya, if you could move to the next slide. Uh, so this sort of fall and winter, we're going to dig through the questionnaire responses and, um, you know, figure out, a, have a, can de develop a full summary of the findings of that scoping phase. Um, and then come winter 2022, we're going to hold a small number of driving forces webinars. These are going to look at the research behind some of the possible um, driving forces. So for example, temp uh, temperature change, sea level rise, shifts in currents, consumer demand some of the driving forces that came out of the questionnaire and the webinars. Um, and then we will in the spring, well, later winter, early spring, we're going to hold an in-person workshop to create the frameworks and, and set of scenarios that describe how climate change might affect stock distribution, availability, and other aspects of East Coast fisheries by 2024. And I can take uh, any questions. Thanks, Tony. Any questions for Tony on the climate change scenario plan? Right, Tony, I've got just a real quick question on scoping um, the stakeholder input that you received. You have, did you have a breakdown by chance of, you know, from an industry perspective, from commercial to recreational? Like we we in Maine have a very um, uh, big effort here going on with our uh, climate council um, and what we found is we had very little input from stakeholders on the fishery side so just wondering how that might have broken out if you even had that information i know that we got responses from all i believe it's all aspects of the industry except for maybe shoreside support pat okay. but we did get commercial recreational dealers um, some other folks involved in the questionnaire. Okay, great. I don't have okay. a number in front of me, though. Uh, that's I fine. Can... We can follow up later if we need it. All yeah. right. Okay. Um, any questions for Tony on climate change scenario? Um, seeing no hands, um, move along to other items on the agenda, which uh, are review non-compliance non findings, which we have none. Is there any other business to be brought before the policy board? I am seeing no hands. And with that, uh, I can tell you that uh, because we have no non-compliance findings, the 430 business session will not be needed. Um, so we are going to, uh, we made up a lot of time. We're going to end early. So with that, uh, I just want to thank uh, again the commission for all of their support the last two years as you put up with me being your chairman. And uh, I uh, look forward to the next two years under the leadership of Spud Woodward, who I am sure will do a bang up job. So uh, with that, uh, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much uh, for a very successful week. Thank you, Pat, for your leadership. It's been a pleasure working with you on policy board and other commission business. Thank you, Tony. And looking forward to working with you, Spud and Joe. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, Pat. And uh, thanks for running a great meeting and for very productive, uh, albeit challenging two years for you. <laughs> Let's hear us to a face to face meeting in January. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pat.